Hello. So in this video, we'll continue working through chapter one. Part one, we spent a lot of time just going through the basics of what is statistics, trying to give you a big overview of what we're going to kind of be doing for the entirety of the semester. And again, we keep adding on those little bits so that in the beginning, you know, chapter two, we'll get more into the data collection part, how to collect it, what are good habits. Chapters three and four, we get a little bit more into the organizational parts. And again, we just keep adding and getting a little further into the process. But I wanted you to have that big broad sense as we kind of work our way along. And then again, you see the cumulative total of how statistics will work. So getting into section 1.2, now they start and they give us a couple of quick examples trying to just point out a little what we've been saying about how if you have information how you can then use that to make some decisions so example 1.1 and again i normally don't use the exact examples in the book i try and make fresh ones but just again to make sure we're on the same page and get off to a good start so example 1.1 is called if the shoe fits you should go through and read through the whole thing but basically what they're pointing out here is just simply this. They have two different teams, bunch of athletes, and here we've got, I think one of them, they're both female athletes. We've got 100 basketball players, and then we have 100 gymnasts. And what they do, they have a little frequency table. Now again, tables. Section, I believe it's chapter three, we start off with making different charts and tables and graphs, that kind of work. But they also, again, we kind of got to assume you understand a little bit about graphs and charts. But if you have any trouble with the graphs and charts, we'll go all over that. How to make them, what are the basics, better graphs and charts for different situations. But for right now, I'm just going to use it for the example. So they have these two frequency tables. And on the bottom, they've got the height of the people, and then they've got the frequency. So someone who's 66 inches tall is represented by this bar, and that is about two people. Somebody over here who's 60 inches tall, and we follow that over, and that's about six people. So just basically getting that understanding. And they even tell us over here, or if we didn't know, which chart goes with which group. Well, again, let me just try and zoom in. So looking at those two different ones, one of them are gymnasts, and the other one are basketball players. Who is who? Those are the gymnasts. Those are the basketball players. Why do we know that? Well, we're just looking at their heights. And we're, you know, we kind of have, and this is always comes up in statistics, well, in a lot of places, we kind of have some preformed notions. So if we're thinking about gymnasts versus basketball players, we pick those two sports for a reason. Gymnasts are typically thought of as very small people. You know, for a lot of the flips and maneuvers they do, it helps being a smaller person. Whereas basketball, it helps to be a taller person. So just looking at these two charts, there's more tall people here. We look at these big spikes in the middle, and we're talking about girls who are over six feet tall. That's very tall for a girl. Whereas over here, there's literally like one girl who's over six feet tall who's a gymnast, and there's a lot of girls who are only a little over five feet tall. So that's just understanding, but they take it further. So you have this information in front of you. You're a janitor, somebody cleaning up the gym at the end of the day. You find a pair of sneakers left behind and they're huge. They're big sneakers. Who do you think they belong to? Again, a little bit more of using our own preconceived notions, but there is some truth to this and we'll get into the idea of correlation, but taller people tend to have bigger feet. It's not 100%, but these little trends and things so that we look at this, we could say, well, we would have guessed the basketball players were taller anyway, but now those charts, that kind of confirms it. And now if we're trying to decide who do the big shoes belong to, it's probably one of the basketball players. So it's not perfect, but that's everything we're seeing here. All the idea of information that's in front of us and how we can use that to make a decision. The second example they have over here is now completely different. Now they're talking about water contamination. So both of these, notice, they don't just jump to the graphs of the charts. You've got all this explanation just to set the stage for what they're giving you here. Now even more so, do you know about water contamination? I don't. 
But if you read, they give us some information about what normal levels are, and now we can look at they have a potential leak, a potential contaminant leak, so now they measure these, and now they could use these numbers to decide, you know, the contamination seems to be getting worse, or the contamination seems to be under control. So again, just two very, very different types of examples to try and give you that picture. Again, another one of the broad views. There is data, it's already been organized for us, so now we can look at a situation to try and make a good, smart, informed decision. Okay. So that's it for 1.2. 1.3 is where we kind of really get started. All this is up till now has still kind of been this overview. But now 1.3. Now we start talking about the actual data analysis process. And on page six, they give us six steps. Six steps to data analysis. Now this is one of these places I want to be very clear. The terms we introduce, this type of a process, I would never ask you to verbatim what is the definition of this term or give me the six steps of the data analysis process. But there are plenty of places where for vocabulary words, we just have to understand them to be able to use it for another problem or we might just be able to have to have our own interpretation like statistics. I won't ask you to give me a definition of statistics, but as an essay, I might ask you to explain how statistics could be used for someone in a particular field to, again, you know, how they could use statistics to help themselves in their career. And as a part of that, you need to understand the nature of statistics to fully answer that question. So similarly, maybe on our first test, I ask you to explain the data analysis process and to use an example to go through how someone would go through all those steps. So I don't care if you've got them labeled step one, step two, step three, but it's about having the right beginning, the right understanding of how things begin and how you progress to the end. So now we're kind of repeating this, but now it's just a little more formal in the book. Step one, understanding the nature of the problem. Like I keep saying, statistics doesn't start with data collection. Statistics starts with what do we care about? Looking at some particular, it's not always a problem or a question, sometimes it's a situation that we just wanna know more about. So effective data analysis requires an understanding of the research problem. We must know the goal of the research and what questions we hope to answer. It's important at the beginning to have a clear direction before gathering data to ensure we'll be able to answer the questions of interest using the data collected. So again, if I want to know, I want to be able to rate a new professor. You know, I'm a school board member, we have this new teacher, and I'm trying to decide how effective that teacher is. Well, one way might be looking at the overall performance of the students. There are other things to look at as well, looking at, you know, growth. Are students doing better than they did before? Are they doing worse? But certainly just collecting test scores is a good way to start. But if we try to look at how far the teacher drives to work, that's not going to be very effective. So again, what data we're collecting is certainly going to be an important aspect to answering a question. Deciding what to measure and how to measure it. So again, before we're even collecting data, what is it that we're measuring? I'm not going to read the entire bullets. You should go through and read, but just giving you the overview. Then we get to data collection. And again, data collection. Are we gonna use existing data? Maybe that old existing data was collected under different circumstances. It's no longer useful to us. Or maybe we wanna just do some comparison. You know, we're looking at a new process. I know I keep sticking with teaching for now. Again, we'll use other examples, but maybe it's uh, as a teacher, there's a new technique and we wanna think that and we think this might help the students learn better. Or as a salesperson, a new technique to get people to buy more or as a consumer group. You know, there's just, again, so many things. But as we collect data, again, is the old data good? Do we need new data? Were there any limitations? If new data is being collected, a careful plan must be de developed because the type of analysis that is appropriate and the co conclusions that can be drawn depend on how that data was collected. Then now we've got the data. So now we need to summarize preliminary analysis. So even there, people think about analysis and statistics. We're always trying to do analysis, 
but the more tools we have at our disposal, the better that analysis is. So at the beginning, those basic graphs and charts, whose sneaker is this? Are the contamination levels something we need to be concerned with? Well, you know, again, just by looking at those graphs, we can start, but to make even better conclusions, again, for the sneaker, it's not that terrible of a situation to say, oh, I tried the basketball team, it's not, to then just go to the uh, gymnastics team. But, you know, for deeper issues that we could say, again, this is the right data and that we are collecting it in the right way to answer the questions that we want. Okay, so that summarization, and then again, getting into the analysis, but then more data analysis, formal data analysis, maybe that gets into probability, maybe it gets into correlation, depends on the type of data, the situation we're looking at, and then last, the interpretation of results. And in that interpretation, several questions should be addressed. What can we learn from the data? What conclusions can be drawn? How can our results guide other research? But then take it a little further. This leads to the formulation of a new research question, right? As soon as we finish, it's not that statistics ever ends. It's just done for now. Maybe we just need to redo this survey later on to see if the results stay the same. Maybe we want to add more to it. So it never ends. So that interpretation is not this is it and we're done. We should always be thinking about what comes next. These new lead questions, uh, these new questions lead back to the first step. So it's a very iterative process. It keeps repeating itself over and over. That interpretation of results I think that should also be included some discussion of are there any limitations that if we know by the way we collected data that we're limited, that should definitely be discussed in those results. So again, a lot of things we've seen, people who think statistics is just about data and crunching numbers, that's not correct. Even when people get past that, people overgeneralize and overexaggerate what those results actually mean. That's something we're going to work on. And then for people who think, okay, I haven't exaggerated, I'm saying what the numbers and what everything tells me, but then to also include that. What comes next? What limitations were there? How can we try and overcome them? What other questions? How can we build on this? That is the full process. So now we start getting some of our particular terms that we have to be familiar with. And the first one is the idea and the difference between a population and a sample. So in our book, the population is the entire collection. Whatever it is we're measuring, the entire collection of people, of individuals, of objects, of data. If I want to look at the test scores from my class, the population is all the test scores from my class. If I want to look at the shoe sizes of six-year-olds, well, then I need to consider all six-year-olds. Again, language is important. If you want to be more limiting, well, then you need to be clear. If I only want to consider six-year-olds in New York City, well, that needs to be made very clear somewhere as I'm discussing the whole situation, whether it's just that big, again, pointing those two previous examples, the whole write-up before you got to the chart. Whenever you give an example, it can sometimes be done in a sentence, but it's often at least a long sentence or a couple of sentences because so many things you have to discuss. What is it you care about? Who you're looking into? So if I say I want to look at shoe sizes for six-year-old children in New York City, well, then my population are the six-year-olds that live in New York City. But now a sample, a sample is simply a subset of the population. So we really want to keep getting this established. The idea of population has the idea of the word all, everyone, all objects, all people, all data. Now again, what is all? We have to be very clear on that. And then the subset, the I'm sorry, the sample is some smaller group. So if I want to look at salaries for people who work at Amazon, well then my population are all of the Amazon employees. If I only then look at the women employees, that would be a sample. If I only look at employees under the age of 25, that would be a sample. If I just collect the salaries of just 30 randomly selected employees, that would still be a sample. 
because in any one, in every one of those examples, I'm always looking at all the Amazon employees as the big group, as the everyone, and then all those other things I said were limiting in some way, I'm only getting a smaller portion of that same group. That's kind of our first problem overall. I would say as far as a written problem, understanding statistics, there's a few little questions I could ask. And again, we'll build on those. But for right now and your homework, 1.3 is the first section that even has homework problems. And a lot of it is defining who is the population and then giving possible samples or writing and realizing a sample that is being given inside of a problem. So let's practice that for a few minutes. So if I told you I wanted to look at the um, average commute time for a employee that commutes from the Bronx, every person who works and commutes from the Bronx is now my population. Notice I had to keep adding words though. Again, all the words matter. If I just say I care about commute time and I leave it at that, it's like, well, who do we care about? Are we talking about commute time for people who drive, commute time for people who take the subway, commute time for everybody? So again, we have to be very clear. So by saying I want the commute time for all people who live in the Bronx, now I've established my population. Everybody who works and lives in the Bronx is my population. What are possible samples? Well, whenever we talk about people, samples are easy. It's always easy to break up samples where by just selecting a certain number, I randomly selected 100 people who commute from the Bronx. Well, that's a sample because it's not everybody. But then more so than that, if I only look again, if I look at gender, if I look at all the men, well, that's a sample. That is not all. If I look at all the women, if I look at all the people, if I look at age, and I look at people who are under the age of 25, people who are between the ages of 30 and 40, people who are over the age of 55, anytime, every single one of those gives me an entirely new sample. I could combine them. I can look at men who are between the ages of 20 and 30. So it's not just gender, it's not just age. There are all these little ways to break things down. Now the one thing, you don't want to try and generate a sample by using a criteria based on the question. Now that sounds confusing, but go back to my example. So if I'm looking at my population is again, I care about people who commute from the Bronx and how long it takes for them to commute to work. Well, if I'm... Um, How do I want to say this? If my population, so I'm looking at all those people, and now if I try and make my sample, I only care about people who commute more than a half an hour, you're already getting into funny business. So now your results are already skewed because a part of the criteria that made that person a part of your sample is already relying on their answer to your question. Okay, maybe that one was complicated, so let's use a different one. I care about what color car people, again, so again, I gotta be very clear. So I care about what color car people who live, who own a car in Queens, what color is their car? Okay, now I've just generated an entire population. Everybody who owns a car in Queens is my population. If I say I wanna look at a sample and my sample is people whose cars are blue or green, well, what's the purpose of asking the question, what color is your car, when I'm already limiting it to people who are only gonna answer blue or green? So technically, when we get to that point of give me a sample, technically that counts, because that is, by definition, those people would be a subset of the entire population. But you're already, like, talking about getting useful data, you're already screwing up that, messing that up, because you're already limiting your responses. So that's the only thing when it comes to picking out a sample. Okay, let's do it again. I want to look, now let's go bigger. I want to look across the country and I want to look at all people who are married and I want to know how many children do they have. Well, again, now my population is huge. All married people across the entire country. Now, again, if I want to do a sample 
And with that type of a question, my whole interest is how many children do they have? Well, I shouldn't do a sample that then breaks down based on the number of children. How many children do people have if they already have more than two or they already have a child? Now, if I want to look at how many children do people have who have adopted a child? Or again, that, that might be an interesting thing to look at that works more in the sample setup and is not restricting my data. It's focusing on a particular aspect, the idea of adoption. But again, there's still plenty of other ways where I could still just look how many children based on age, how many children, but I only look at people who've been married for 10 years or more. So many easy ways to get samples. Now let me reverse the question. What if I want, if I give you a group of people and I want you to look at a statistical situation or ask a statistical question that makes that group the entire population? This sounds tricky at first, but it's actually really easy. If I told you I want you to look at um, NFL fans, football fans who live in New York, uh, let's be very clear, New York, New York State. I want you to look at a statistical question that makes football fans who live in New York State the population. Folks, you can ask almost anything you want, but you just have to be very clear somewhere in the write-up that the population is all the football fans who live in New York State. So you can ask a very football-related question for fans of football in New York State what is your favorite football team? For fans of football in New York State, what is your favorite food for Super Bowl Sunday? You know, you could ask football-related questions. You could ask completely different questions. For, but you just every time you ask the question or you outline a scenario, you have to be very clear that it's football fans in New York State. So I could ask things like, how much money do football fans in New York State earn per year? What kind of car? Do New York football fans drive? You know, I could ask any type of question at all, but in order to make sure that particular group is my population, I have to be very clear in my language. So I don't just say football fans, football fans from New York State, okay? If I wanted to look at, you know, students from Robert Moses High School as my population, well, again, what do you want to ask? You could ask anything at all. How many pets do Robert Moses High School students have? By clearly establishing the Robert Moses High School students, you're making them the population. And then you ask whatever question you want. How tall are Robert Moses High School students? What is the GPA of a Robert Moses High School student? Uh, you know, you could ask questions that are directly related to school, since you're kind of focusing on their school as the population. You could look at how far they commute to work, uh, 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 that they actually commute to get to school from home. Or again, completely different things. How many pairs of sneakers do Robert Moses High School students own? You know, all those different types of things, but the language itself is so important. So that's population and sample two words we are going to hear a lot. I mean, even just in that data analysis, when we were talking about the steps, one of those things we mentioned is the idea of using a sample to generalize information for the entire population. Again, all these things we're still gonna talk more about. Sampling is a whole chapter on it, but even right now, why would we do that? Well, just as we're going through some of those examples that we were saying, the population might be huge. So whether the population has a thousand or a million, you know, a lot of these are very big numbers. It might be impractical to collect all that data. So the ability to get generalized information, but there that's where sampling becomes so important. So that'll all come up in chapter two, but just the initial distinction, identifying a population, being able to think of possible samples or to look inside of a problem who is the overall, the all for the population, and then who are the particulars that are the sample in this exact scenario. All right, so that finishes, oh no, sorry, one last thing from section 1.3. Breaking down statistics a little further, we also have what we call descriptive statistics and then inferential statistics. 
it's kind of like two branches. The descriptive is the first branch. The branch of statistics that includes the methods for organizing and summarizing data. So after we get all the data, actually collecting it and organizing it, putting it in graphs and charts, that's the descriptive side. But then for inferential statistics, that's kind of that second part. That invol involves generalizing from a sample to a population, being able to uh, assess the reliability of such a generalization. So that's kind of the secondary part. So two terms that we hear now, but terms that are gonna be, again, more explored and expanded on as we go further. So in this video, we're gonna finish with section 1.4. So we still, this is the last part of chapter one, but still several more terms that we have to discuss. Types of data, and like I said, they start giving us some of the most basic graphical displays. It's certainly a good thing to, again, look through the book, get a few of those familiarities. But like I said, they start very basic, and if you're still concerned, don't be. Again, chapter three. Everything we discuss here is gonna come up again in chapter three. So, what are the types of data? Well, first thing, we should really, uh, you know, get a formal definition. So two definitions. First is the word variable. Now, again, math, a lot of us have heard that word variable for a long time, and it's a very algebraic definition that we remember. The idea of a variable is a letter used in place of a number. And we still kind of do that a little bit here, but when we say a variable, it's the characteristic whose value may change from one observation to another. It's what we are measuring. So if I'm looking at test scores, the variable would be the test scores themselves. If I'm looking at the salaries of Amazon employees, the variable, what are we measuring? We're looking at the salaries. If we're looking at commute time for workers, the variable is the commute time, okay? That's the characteristic whose value may change from one observation to another. One person takes 25 minutes to commute to work. Another person takes 75 minutes. That's what we mean by variable. So a variable, again, that's a little tough to get used to because we're always, well, variable, the variable is X. And we still do that here, but it's often, well, what is the variable in this problem? In this problem, X measures the number of broken light bulbs in a shipment. X measures the number of successful sales encounters had by a salesman. You know, we'll get it, but that's what are we actually measuring? And sometimes it's a direct measure. How tall are you? How much money do you make? But other times it's again more of a, what did you go and do? But that's the idea of a variable. And then data, data is the collection of observations on one or more variables. That's the other thing we have to realize everybody a variable, we're not always just looking at one piece. You know, maybe if we're looking at jumping ahead a little bit, the idea of bivariate, bi stands for two. If we're looking at a bivariate situation, we're looking at two variables. So maybe I'm not just looking at your test score. Maybe I'm looking at two things. How long did you study? And then what is your test score? So student A tells me, I studied for three hours and I got an 87 on the test. So they gave me two data values. Three, how long they studied, three hours. 87, the actual score on the exam. Somebody else studied for zero hours and got a 51. Somebody else studied for one hour and got a 75. Somebody studied for four hours and got a 97. You know, that we're looking at every individual person that I'm looking to collect data from, I'm collecting two pieces of data, one for each variable. So the data itself, whether that data is numerical, like the two examples with how long you studied, what is your test score, whether it's something that's more categorical, what is your favorite color, what kind of car do you drive, you know, maybe it's a yes or no question, do you have a pet, do you have a favorability with, you know, Politics, when we were going back about different situations and we talked about consumers, but there's a lot of politics, so maybe it's just a yes or no question. Are you favorable to this new proposal? Are you favorable to the new tax plan, to the new stimulus package? Sometimes just collecting those yes or no answers, that's the data that we're looking for. So, not too surprising, 
and those are two terms we're gonna hear a lot. They then jump into a univariate data set when we're just looking to collect one piece of information. And again, bivariate would be two, trivariate, you're collecting three. A lot of what we're gonna do in this class is univariate, but there will be some bivariate pieces we look at as well. The next big breakdown is categorical data versus numerical data. So there's a, a synonym. Our book really starts with the categorical or numerical, which really helps. Most other books in my experience use the synonyms. Categorical data is also known as qualitative data. Numerical data is also known as quantitative. Quantitative kind of coming from the word quantity, again, something that we naturally associate a numerical measure to. How much do you weigh? How many objects do you have? Quantities are measured by numbers. But then people try and look at qualitative, that word, and they think that is some measure of quality, good products and bad products. That's not it at all. So I, I like that quantitative connects to numerical, and some people can use that as a connection but then again, qualitative and quality, uh-uh. It's qualitative just links to categories. So again, when the variable we are looking to collect data for, if you are collecting data that is numerical, how tall are you? How many televisions are in your home? How many broken light bulbs were in that set? How many hours did you work last week? How long did it take you to commute to work, to commute to school? Um, how far did you drive your car last year? All those examples are all quantitative. And the way to know that is just think about what an answer. How many miles did you drive your car last year? Whether the answer is 100 miles or 2,000 miles, your answer is a number. That is numerical. That is quantitative. Whereas, what color car do you drive? What is your favorite color? How, um, no. How many pairs of jeans do you own? That would be another quantitative. What is your preferred brand of jeans? Uh, what is your preferred vehicle? Again, all those yes, no questions. Do you have a pet? Do you own a house? Do you own a car? Any of those yes, no type questions. All those fall under what we call categories. So categorical type data. So several examples, we just did a whole bunch but definitely being able to look at a situation, be able to break down, look at what is the variable, and then start looking at the data and break down what type of data would you be receiving. But now we have to go, uh, numerical data has another breakdown. Once it's categorical, qualitative, that's that, and we stop there. So again, what's your favorite color? What color car do you have? What brand of sneakers do you prefer? Um, you know, any of those types of things. What neighborhood do you live in? What borough do you live in? You know, what state do you live in? Any of those types of questions, all categorical, and that's as far as the breakdown goes. But all those numerical examples, numerical, we break down a little further. We talk about the idea of discrete versus continuous numerical data. So this definition comes up on page 11. Discrete numerical data, they describe it as first again, both of these they start off, it's a numerical variable. You have to start with that. You're starting with numerical data, a numerical variable. You're getting numerical quantitative type of information. You get discrete data if the possible values of the variable correspond to isolated points on the number line. That is a very fancy and hard way of saying the data is whole number, whole number only, no fractions or decimals. Whereas continuous, a numerical variable results in continuous data if the set of possible va values forms an entire interval on the number line. Again, what that basically means is that fractions and decimals are possible. So, how many televisions do you have in your house? That is discrete. The answer to that is zero, one, two, three, four, five. You do not have two and a half televisions or 3.1 televisions. 
You may have televisions that are bigger or smaller than other ones, but when I just say, how many televisions did you have? How many broken light bulbs were there? How many students are in this class? How many siblings do you have? They're all whole number answers. You don't have two and one third sisters. You have two sisters, three sisters, four sisters. So that's the idea. That is discrete. Now continuous is where we can have those fractions or decimals. So we can say, uh, you know, how much water did you drink today? Okay. How long did you run on the treadmill? Or, you know, how long did you work out for? Now, here are a few funny questions. How much do you weigh? How tall are you? How long does something take? The funny part is a lot of people, when we think about the answers, we have a natural tendency to think those are discrete, to think those are whole number answers. How tall are you? Well, you know, people say, I am five foot two inches. I am six feet tall. Maybe just to make it easier, just, just use inches so I don't have the feet inches combination. So someone who's five feet tall, I am 60 inches tall. I am 64 inches tall. I am 67 inches tall. But can you be 67 and a half inches tall or 65.8 inches tall or, you know, 73.1 inches tall? Yeah, you can. Now, we often round off, but technically, those fractions and decimals can certainly exist, so that is continuous. That idea of like a number line, even though we may be rounding off to whole numbers, you could fall in between. Weight is a little bit better, because for a lot of us, if you have a digital scale, well, you get the decimal. It doesn't just tell you, okay, she weighs 120 pounds, he weighs 182 pounds, he weighs 172 pounds. You know, it's, no, you look at the scale and it's 172.1 pounds, 130.6 pounds, 210.4. And you know, a lot of the scales stop at one decimal. But again, the point is that there are those fractional decimal values. Same thing with time, everybody. We have a natural tendency to round off. You know, it took me 25 minutes to get to work, but maybe it took me 25 minutes and 10 seconds. Those extra seconds are a fractional component of minutes. So like I said, it's, that could be a little bit tricky. So sometimes we have to take it that extra step further. Not just what are the answers people give me, but does it make sense to have a fractional or decimal component? That's the real key. And again, we talk about how many electronic devices are in your home, how many doors are in your house, you know, things like that. that. That's very obvious. Those are whole numbers. But when you have the possibility for time, for height, for weight, that is then continuous. Okay, the last part of section 1.4. So again, a lot of terms, and that's a secondary breakdown being able to classify data as numerical or categorical, quantitative versus qualitative. And then secondly, only for the numerical values, if it is numerical, to then be able to say, oh, that is continuous, that is discrete. Last thing, frequency distributions, bar charts for categorical data. We'll do more of this for continuous, I mean for numerical, but for categorical data, just to realize one of the most basic graphs and charts, just collecting how many people said this. I collected information from 100 people on what is their favorite color, and 34 of them said blue, 10 of them said red, 26 of them said green, and what am I up to? I think I'm up to 70, so 30 of them said purple. You know, I went and collected that, but now I can make a, a chart. I can list off my categories, so the different colors people gave me, and then have a frequency, which is the number of people who answered. So I had 30 some people said blue, so I would have a bar that goes up to 30 something on the frequency total. That is the idea of a frequency table. It's very simple, and again, we'll get more practice to it. What is a good sense of scale? How many bars should there be? There should be a bar for every category for which someone answered. So that's just a first thing just to realize. We've already seen some of those tables. We'll see more of that. 
a bar chart. Bars can go vertically, bars can go horizontally. So we've got a few possibilities, but they give you some very basic instruction and a quick example. The other big thing I wanna introduce right now is the idea of relative frequency. Again, if I had 34 people said they prefer blue and I surveyed 100, the relative frequency would be the frequency of people who did what I asked out of the total number. So 34 out of 100 people said they prefer blue. The plain frequency would be 34. The relative would be 34 over 100. Now we very often use a decimal for that, but you can leave it as a fraction. This is a good place to point out. Fractions, decimals, percentages, they're all the same thing. I chose 100 to keep this first example nice. 34 people said blue, 34 out of 100, that's a decimal 0.34. That would be the same as saying 34% of the people prefer blue. So we can do that and percentages and decimals are very nice going back and forth, but they're not always gonna deal with such nice numbers. But I definitely wanted to point that out. Again, we are gonna see percentages, fractions, and decimals. These, again, these go back and forth. So I wanted us to see that right now and get that term. Regular frequency, how many people said whatever it is. You know, I surveyed 250 people. Do they approve of the new uh, stimulus plan that President Biden is proposing? And 217 said yes. Well then 217 out of 250, you can get the decimal out of that. What is that? That's eight, uh, that would be 86.4. And then uh, 0.864 as the decimal. So 86.4 percentage of the people support that tax plan. So that's the idea. I just wanted to bring that up. We'll see more of that. And the last thing they bring up here is quickly a dot plot. Pretty much the same idea as a bar chart. Instead of having a bar that goes up for how many people the frequency, you literally just use a dot. Now again, it comes up again in chapter three. This is just a quick introduction. They almost mention that as just a quick, again, just getting you used to looking at some data and just seeing that first step of organization. Look at these two problems. All of this is data. So just looking at all of that doesn't help at all, but just looking at a quick dot plot can really already get us started with organization and summary. So people can quickly look in this and get a nice general idea. Still all of our graphs and charts, we're always gonna have to label them well. Sometimes the labels give enough so a reader understands what that chart is conveying. Sometimes we need to add a little extra, a sentence or two, make it sure where, uh, make it clear, I should say, where the data came from, you know, where we collected it from, what it's being used for, the units involved. So there's still a few, a lot more we have to discuss. But overall, hopefully this is, gives you a good start. And last time, if you don't have your book for this week, that's okay. You could still watch this video and get a good sense. Make sure you highlight in your notes some of those important vocab words. But you want to come back, do this homework, read over these extra examples. Again, that's how we're going to get the good experience that allows us to build.